I have started, uh, started started the recording, so we can start anytime. Thank you, Sapri. Okay, Dr. Saxena, can we start? Yes, please. Good morning, everybody. Welcome all to the APHRS Cardiac Rhythm Therapy <coughs> webinar series, which is supported by Abbott. My name is Sabarivasan, and I'm with the Abbott India Education team. As every challenge has a silver lining, the challenge of COVID-19 has made it possible to bring international education direct to your home. We thank APHRS for giving this platform to make this web education possible. Today in our APHRS web series, Fish and Education Program, our objective is to bring experts from all over Asia to discuss on managing patients with cardiac implantable electronic devices. This will help to understand the issues at the same time, gain knowledge to manage the CID patients better. Along with me, I have my colleagues from India, Hong Kong, Singapore, and as well as Malaysia. Regarding your queries during the presentation, kindly type it in the chat box so the faculty will answer at the end of their presentation. In fact, you will be having almost 15 minutes question session after each session. To chat the program, we have with us eminent physician, Dr. Anil Saxena, Director of Cardiac Pacing and Electrophysiology at Fortis Escort Heart Institute, India. He's a pioneer in implantation of ICD and biventricular pacemakers. With an experience of over 30 years, he's an internationally acknowledged expert in the field of cardiac arrhythmias and electrophysiology. Dr. Saxena is the immediate past President of Indian Heart Rhythm Society as well. With all this, I request Dr. Saxena to take over and chair the program. Please, sir. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And uh, it's indeed a pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this APHRS Symposium. I hope you and your families are safe during this uh, difficult time. Now, today's program has been designed to discuss some important aspects of ICD and CRT therapies. We have an excellent panel of speakers and I welcome all of them, Dr. Lawrence, Dr. Davinder Singh, Dr. Palanan and Dr. Karthike. All of them, uh, I welcome you all to this symposium. Uh, I'm sure we will get very important and valuable insights from them during the sessions. Uh, the program is divided into two sessions, one on ICD therapy and one on CRT therapy. So without uh, wasting much time, I would like to welcome Dr. Lawrence Jesuraj uh, for the first presentation. He's a consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist at Kowai Medical Center and Hospital Coimbatore. And he has presented various papers and peer reviewed journals in the international science conferences. And he runs a uh, Kowai Heart Rhythm Summit every year, uh, which is very popular in the, in the region and which uh, is attended by a lot of fellows and um, everyone. So welcome, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, please uh, deliver your presentation. Yeah, hope my slides are visible and- uh, Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you all, uh, good morning to all. Uh, my topic for discussion will be uh, goal, the appropriate therapy. First of all, my sincere thanks to APHRS and Abad for giving this wonderful opportunity to be with among with you. So we know very well, uh, we put ICDs to save a lot of lives. We have saved a lot, but there are situations where uh, close to uh, around 30 to 40 percent of the, these patients can receive uh, inappropriate shocks over a period of lifetime of these devices. So we always uh, very much interested to reduce these inappropriate shocks because it improves quality of life to the patient. It increases ICD therapy acceptance. We know very well a patient who has received more than three, four shocks in a day is terribly worried about getting another shock. He's uh, uh, very much affected uh, by the uh, fear of getting a shock again. Not only that, we know ICD therapies are costlier and uh, uh, I, it definitely extends ICD's longevity. It causes less demand for post-shock care. Most of the patients who have who have more than two shocks in a uh, day, 
uh, tend to visit the hospital, gets admitted, get them evaluated and treated. So it avoids a lot of cost. Avoiding shock is pretty important because it reduces pain and anxiety and increases device acceptance across patient uh, spectrum. The patient who has got an ICD and a shock becomes a bad model for the next patient because they are so much worried about ICD shocks. To reduce healthcare and burden and improve patient quality of life, and we know very well, the more number of shocks are delivered, you tend to have uh, increasing LV dysfunction and worsening heart failure. So if you reduce a shock, it can reduce uh, further admissions for a heart failure. Not only that, close to uh, 2 lakh, uh, 1 lakh, 99,000 patients receive high power device implants and replacements each year. These patients receive uh, close to 54,000 shock each year based on reported shock rates. The annual cost of the care related to these shocks are pretty huge. How we are going to reduce the shock therapy? We know very well the shock is intended to treat a life-threatening arrhythmia, but there are instances where your shocks can be delayed, postponed, or avoided in most of these patients uh, by avoiding a non-committed shocks, programming more ATPs. You program the SVTs in such a way that uh, most of the SVTs are diagnosed as SVT, not treated otherwise. Filters for T wave noise, uh, T wave and noise, it's pretty important. I think a lot of devices which come nowadays with the T wave uh, algorithms and noise detection is part of most of the device algorithms now. You make sure that you switch on these algorithms and ATP for faster VTs. We know very well ICD street uh, VT, VF just by looking at the number or uh, uh, the rate. They don't uh, really identify which is a VT, which is a VF by uh, looking at the morphology of the rhythm. They identify all these by looking at the rate. We know very well in a lot of patients, we tend to have faster VTs. You have to program this faster VT in a separate way so that not all these VTs are not detected as VFs because we know very well that VFs are treated in a separate way in ICD algorithms. You don't put SVT uh, discrimination algorithms in. Uh, you try to deliver a shock as early as possible because VF is a life-threatening arrhythmia. So you program a, a faster VTs in a separate way so that they are taken care the way VTs are taken care of. Strategic programming of deduction time and rate. This is pretty important. You have to know about every patient's indication for an ICD. If you have last detected ventricular tachycardias, and you know very well that a lot of patients, you, you tend to start them on antiarrhythmics the moment you are going to put an ICD on. Maybe a beta blocker in some patients who have multiple episodes, maybe on amedrone. They tend to reduce uh, uh, rate of VTs. So the, the VT which you have detected at a faster rate may not come again in the particular patient. So you may have to continuously watch the device, uh, find out what are the rhythms which are being recorded and program accordingly. We know uh, from our past experience that a lot of these patients tend to have non-sustained ventricular episodes. In Holters, we have seen a lot of these patients who have indicated for ICD to have a non-sustained episodes. You have to make sure that these non-sustained episodes are not treated. So you have to program in such a way that your non-sustained VTs are left alone to drugs. So your ICD does not interfere with treatment of these non-sustained episodes. But how you do that? You delay the therapy. You are not going to delay therapy for a life-threatening arrhythmias, but you can uh, delay uh, therapy for arrhythmias which are hemodynamically stable so that the pay, if the, there is an option of uh, spontaneous termination uh, that is allowed for the particular patient. So when you are looking at a, 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 a reducing the incidence of shock, you are not only looking at the inappropriate shocks. You know very well there are uh, uh, times when your shock is delivered inappropriately to an SVT or an AF, uh, but they are apart. Their appropriate therapy also has to be programmed in a such a way that you don't treat every VT and VF with a shock. Need not. Uh, by previous experiences, we know that ATP is a very good form of uh, uh, treating these ventricular arrhythmias. So you tailor your appropriate therapy just towards VT and VF. You correct unnecessary uh, therapies being delivered. You correctly detect ventricular arrhythmias, but treat more aggressively with the ATPs or a shock when, whenever, when it is absolutely necessary only. Most of the adverse events are shock related. So you try, try to program more ATPs if the patient has a termination with ATPs. You look at uh, RCTs, starting from made it to pain-free treatment to close to that average varies 15 to <clears throat> in some series close to 40 50 percent of the patients have received a inappropriate shocks if you look at an SCT heft uh, uh, of a total of 812 shocks in 259 patients inappropriate shocks were 
36 percent pretty huge that means every uh, one shock out of three was inappropriately delivered this stresses upon importance of programming these devices well and following them in a proper way so that you don't deliver unnecessary shocks uh, this is what i was saying close to one third of shocks can be inappropriate you can avoid shocks by increasing the nad's do not treat slow vts by shocks but treat them with atps increase atps for fossil vts and avoid inappropriate shocks so close to in some series close to 50 percent of the shocks were inappropriate shock therapies tend to decrease quality of life patients acceptance to the therapy is dramatically reduced so most of the time the inappropriate shocks are delivered due to following reasons the svds are misclassified t waves are oversensed the lead noises are sensed and it could be electromagnetic interference there could be a discriminator overrides also and as i told you the premature reduction of not sustained vts that there can be svt overlap you program you follow up the devices if you are find out uh, there is an svt overlap between a vt zones you program the vt in a such a way that you don't no longer get into the svt zones t wave over sensing most of the devices have algorithms for that emi you direct if you emi inquire with the patient history of exposure to emi and find out which kind of an emi he is exposed to and make advices and uh, appropriate uh, therapy for the patient so that he, he does not go close to the emi source lead failures have to be detected very early if you find any uh, uh, physiologically non viable signals in your lead you always make sure that you are uh, identified a lead um, noise and these need noise and lead failures have to be detected early and it has to be replaced to avoid unnecessary shocks discriminator overrides we know close to 10 percent of svts can longer more than one minute and close to three percent of svts can longer more than three minutes so svt then uh, that lasts longer can override the duration of uh, your svt timeout and it can deliver a therapy so if you have a patient who have a, a repeated episodes of svts which are last longer you make sure that your svt timeout has been switched off are programmed appropriately so that you don't allow the override to come in and uh, deliver the shock. Premature reduction, uh, this I already discussed with you, always program in a such a way that your NSVTs are allowed to self-terminate. You don't interfere with the uh, treatment of these NSVTs. Uh, <clears throat> so you always uh, ensure and sensitive discrimination for SVTs, address TV over sensing and EMIs, direct lead values as early as possible, so there are a lot of ways you can uh, program these devices, particularly for a primary prevention, you have to be very, very, very uh, conservative and we are programming for VT and VF. In this uh, study, they programmed uh, VT zones at 250 beats per minute. It's pretty, pretty conservative. You know very well that we, a lot of times we tend to program in the earlier days or VF zones in the range of 190s. Nowadays, we know very well that in a primary prevention uh, indications, no need for you to program an ICD to a very aggressive stand. You can uh, increase the B2 direct to close to 30 to 40. That allows a lot of time for this uh, self-terminating non-sustained non VTs to go off. You make sure you treat only the hemodynamically unstable uh, VTs and which are going to sustain and cause trouble for the patient. And whenever possible, try to program more ATPs. And every time patient comes back for a follow-up, make sure you go through into the every VT episodes, identify and understand what exactly happened, how it got initiated, and how it was going and which, which therapy terminated it. And you make sure that if your ATPs are terminating the VT uh, uh, very well, then you increase your number of ATPs in a such a way that you tend to avoid a lot of shocks. If you are programming a shocks also, tend to program shocks in a such a way that you go with the low energy shocks because a lot, lot of these VTs uh, tend to terminate with low energy shocks. If you, there are patients who tend to uh, terminate the VTs with five to 10 joules of uh, energy and there are devices like Abarts, which where you can change the tilt, make sure that you deliver shock in an effective way so that the number of shocks required are less. And that's also important. You don't program in a patient who requires high energy shocks to low energy so that patient uh, has to get three or four shocks to terminate a rhythm. So you look at every VT in your, VT, uh, in your interrogation reports and program in an appropriate way so that uh, you don't deliver further shocks. There are multiple ways where you can uh, 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 program these uh, ICDs. I'm not going into detail. And another more important thing is when we are talking about uh, um, uh, appropriate therapy, another important thing you have to remember is not only you have to avoid treating a, a, 
uh, arrhythmia which does not require a shock, you have to 100% treat arrhythmia which requires a shock. You, we know a lot of times we tend to get a R waves are on the lesser side. Uh, we tend to implant ICDs with the R waves around five in the range. Sometimes in a patients who have a, um, whatever you do, the leads may not get into a great position. You ultimately end up in a R waves which are not great. Not only that, in some patients, when you have an excellent R during an implantation, during an episode of ventricular fibrillation, the patient's R wave can go down dramatically. That can be a dropout of sensing during these uh, rhythms. Particularly, this applies to a polymorphic VTs and ventricular fibrillations. They tend to have completely uh, disarray of uh, ventricular signals. And there's a possibility that your uh, uh, ventricular uh, lead can undersense these episodes and it can take longer time to detect or uh, they can miss it. It is not very uncommon for us to see uh, some of the ventricular fibrillation patient presenting with a synco uh, before uh, shock is delivered. We always want to avoid that because the device is already there. If the detect can, device can detect early, it can deliver a therapy early so that patient can avoid an episode of a synco. So this is how about uh, brought in. Uh, it is called ventricular uh, therapy assurance. This added a new discriminator. It is designed to identify and treat arrhythmias that are inherently likely to be hemodynamically unstable like a polymorphic VTs or VF. It maintains fast detection for arrhythmia securing therapy outside the program setting also. So how it works, it's designed to identify and treat arrhythmia that are uh, uh, inherently hemodynamically unstable. Uh, this uh, assurance uh, looks at a poor far field uh, sensing on the discriminator sense uh, channel at strategic times and applies new detection parameters when criteria are met. Uh, when this therapy is on, uh, HV therapy for 86% of patients who would have been otherwise untreated, close to 0.2% of the population for potentially life-threatening arrhythmias are treated appropriately. So how does it work? So VA therapy assurance uses uh, <clears throat> a discrimination channel to check for the far-field sensing, under-sensing during a potential ventricular episode. If it is determined that a far-field under-sensing is present, the algorithm is switched on or triggered. The program parameters are automatically changed for the remainder of the episode. Until that particular episode is over, uh, uh, VF therapy assurance is switched on and detects these therapies uh, in an efficient way. So how it works logically. There is a potential ventricular episodes. VTPF detection, uh, if the far field sensing is good, the normal detection protocol is allowed and there's an end up episode that timer sets on by itself. And there is a VTVF episode and 45 cycle timer expires and far field sensing shows signal dropout or consistently small signals. The VF therapy assurance is switched on or triggered and VF diagnosis and therapy is initiated. If it delivers and delivers a shock and it ends as an episode, then uh, again, the timer is switched on. So not only with the uh, goal for the therapy is to deliver, a, uh, avoid a non-appropriate shock, all the times you have to make sure that you deliver a shock when it's appropriately indicated also. To summarize, a challenge with ICD therapy is risk of inappropriate shocks and unnecessary shocks. Inappropriate shocks can be minimized by addressing poor discrimination of VT due to misclassification of SVTs, lead-related issues, T-wave oversensing, and electromagnetic interference, and turning off discriminator overrides if you are finding out that the SVTs are lasting longer, Unnecessary shocks are also can be minimized by using a strategic programming, such as programming more ATPs as first therapy, avoiding early detection of non-sustained VDs. You don't want to detect every NSVDs and treat them. We have a lot of uh, uh, trials, data available like prepare, empiric, and decision, and pain-free, uh, which offer a lot of programming options. You can uh, use them for a nominal settings in the population. And also every programming uh, uh, interface with the patient you look at the episodes and programming according to the patient's need and kind of the VT patient has during the episodes. You're delaying the therapy for primary prevention ICDs reduces unnecessary shocks. Particularly, you have to be very, very conservative when you are uh, programming a primary prevention uh, ICDs. Secondary prevention, at least you have a, a, a data on how the VT is going to come and what are the previous episodes available. In a primary prevention, you, you be remain conservative for VTs. When a VT episode comes, you look at the VT episodes and programming uh, changes can be made according to the episodes what has been recorded. So with this, I'll finish my talk. Thank you.
சார் இவர் மியூட்டட் சார் டாக்டர் சக்சேனா யூ ஹேவ் டு அன்மியூட் சார் சாரி thank you dr lawrence i think that was an excellent presentation and we'll have discussion at the end of this session so uh, for the next uh, presentation i invite dr devinder singh from singapore he is director of cardiac informatics department of cardiology national university heart center singapore and he is also assistant professor of department of medicine young lu lin school of medicine national university of singapore and senior consultant in the department of cardiology at national university heart center singapore he will speak on remote monitoring in in uh, patients with icd as we know this uh, pandemic has uh, sort of forced us into adoption of remote monitoring it was all or we knew that it is something very good and uh, increasingly we were uh, using it in our patients but i think the adoption has been hastened by um, the pandemic so i uh, invite Dr. Devinder Singh to share his insights into remote monitoring for ICD patients. Dr. Devinder Singh, please. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me, guys? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, APHRS and Ebert to give us this opportunity, uh, sharing knowledge with you guys and. in the process also learning from you guys so i'll be talking on remote monitoring of icd patient with uh, ventricular arrhythmias although the topic mentioned ventricular arrhythmias but i'll be mainly talking about use of home monitoring or remote monitoring for in patient with icds and crtds so as dr saxena has mentioned device uh, follow up earlier used to be just in patient evaluation but slowly we are moving towards remote monitoring in nuh we have almost 99% uh, uptake for remote monitoring and especially in this covid era it has really ushered a new era for telehealth monitoring uh, device uptake now uh, the home remote monitoring uptake has been Uh, increasing in and it, from uh, option it has somehow kind of a necessity now especially when we want to see our patient uh, remotely and we want to reduce their uh, hospital visits or clinic visits and if we talk about remote monitoring what is the difference between remote monitoring and remote interrogation remote monitoring refers to the automated transmission of data based on pre specified alerts related to device functionality and clinical events and remote interrogation refers to routine scheduled remote device interrogation structured structured to mirror in office checkups how exactly remote monitoring works so all the devices now when we we enroll patient for remote monitoring uh, comes with a transmitter this transmitter is usually placed by patient's bedside and it talks to the device by radio frequency signals it takes information and sends that information either via analog signals or via wireless uh, data transfer to a central repository which with depending on which the manufacturer is they have central repositories in europe or america and from there the data is actually transmitted or uh shared via email text messages with the electrophysiologist or the healthcare providers and the frequency of transmission could vary from weeks to daily transmission depending on the proprietary manufacturers uh, algorithms and uh, remote monitoring is now standard of care the hrs uh, consensus statement in 2016 recommended that all patient with cids should be offered remote monitoring as part of the standard follow up management strategy so if it is standard of care i think then we should discuss what is the evidence for this so i will start with this uh, the first major randomized controlled trial uh, looking on efficacy and safety of remote monitoring for patient with icds and uh, in uh, this trial published in circulation uh, had the 
had about 1500 patients which were randomized to conventional follow-up versus remote monitoring follow-up. And as you can see, as you can see, there is almost 45% reduction in, in clinic evaluation in patients who are on home monitoring. So this blue bar is home monitoring and the red is conventional follow-up. And if we look at And if we look at atrial fib uh, early detection of arrhythmia, as you can see, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, SVT, were detected much earlier compared to conventional follow-up. So remote monitoring does not only is, uh, reduces your hospital visits, clinic visits, or ED visits, you can also detect arrhythmias earlier. And if we talk about silent arrhythmias, you can see that in this blue bar, you detect silent arrhythmia much earlier in patients who are on remote monitoring. And followed by trust trial, uh, this another trial randomized control study which came from another manufacturer. Uh, and this is a US-based multicenter study, the CONNECT trial. This trial was to look at efficacy of remote notification uh, to reduce time of clinical decision. That means, does this uh, earlier information we get from device about arrhythmias help us in making clinical decision? So this, the primary objective was of CONNECT trial was to determine whether remote wireless remote, monitor, uh, wireless remote monitoring with automatic clinician, uh, sorry, just. Uh, with automatic clinical clinician alerts reduces the time from clinical event to clinical decision in response to arrhythmia. And as you can see, the distribution of uh, time from clinical event to decision per patient in the remote arm, we are able to make clinical decision based on clinical event much earlier compared to control arm. But in Connect trial, it showed that the healthcare utilization, which is a secondary endpoint, increases in patients with remote monitoring, which most likely is due to the resetting of home alerts in patients who have been detected as arrhythmias. So it depends on uh, what kind of, or what device you are using for remote monitoring. So in this setup in patient with ICD, the healthcare utilization slightly increased in patient who were on remote arm. But when they looked at hospitalization, stay, the length of stay was shorter in patient with uh, remote monitoring versus those patients who are in, in office evaluation arm. So, but it does give us insight. And uh, this was followed up by another trial called ECOS trial. This trial also looked at safety of using uh, ICD with remote monitoring. And uh, they enrolled about 400 patients and randomized into remote monitoring versus home monitoring. As you can see, the remote monitoring patient uh, versus uh, control group, which is the usual conventional follow-up, there is no difference in major adverse event. But if we look at shocks, as uh, Dr. Jasuraj alluded in his talk, that primary aim of ICD, although is to prevent sudden cardiac death, but we want to reduce the incidence of appropriate and in, inappropriate shock. So if you can look at home monitoring group, there was about 52% reduction in inappropriate shock compared to the control group. And that reduction in shock actually translated into extended battery life. And that also reduced patients' clinic visits. So if you can look at, there's almost 24% difference between the control arm and the active arm in healthcare utilization. So there is decreased 
clinic visit or ED visits or unscheduled visits in patients who are in remote monitoring arm. So, so far we know that these trial showed that the remote monitoring is safe, efficacious, and it does reduce uh, inappropriate shock. We get to know about arrhythmias earlier, but does remote monitoring improve outcomes or mortality? So, so this actually led to researchers to further studies whether you know you have any outcome data from remote monitoring, and that brings us to this study uh, called In Time Study, published in Lancet in 2013. This study showed, uh, or they actually. They did this rhythmological and technical parameter monitoring, which was daily. So they were implant-based multi-parameter multi telemonitoring of patients with heart failure. These were patients with CRTD and ICD. And the event triggers which were used in this trial was mean PVCs, which you know, if it goes above 100 per hour, you'll get an alert. CRT pacing percentage below 80%, although this can be reprogrammable. The atrial monitoring episode, including flutter, fibrillation, atrial burden of arrhythmia, and then VTVF events, as well as technical parameters from the lead. And patient was also connect, uh, contacted if they don't receive a message for at least three days. So you can see that in time showed significant reduction of worsening of clinical status. There was almost 30% reduction in uh, worsening of clinical status. That also included death, overnight hospitalization of, for worsening heart failure, worsening in NYHA class, deterioration in patients' global self-assessment. And if you look at uh, mortality, which is actually a secondary uh, endpoint, there was significant decrease in all-cause mortality in patients who were in remote monitoring. So this trial was very encouraging. Uh, they, they showed not only that you have reduced worsening heart failure, but you have actually decreased in all-cause mortality who, in patients who are on remote monitoring arm. So actually that led to change in the 2016 ESC guidelines, and they recommended that multi-parameter multi monitoring based on ICD in-time approach may be considered in symptomatic patient with reduced ejection fraction in order to improve clinical outcome. But this was only a class to be indication because this, this in-time study was, uh, although a randomized study, but it's a single center study. And uh, further to this, uh, different researchers started analyzing whether ICD patients with remote monitoring have any outcome difference or not. So this is a very large uh, systemic review uh, of seven RCTs. And they showed that there was that it suggested that remote monitoring does not improve all cause mortality. So the only trial which shows is in time, but the trial we just discussed, trust, uh, more care, connect, e-cost, they all showed no significant difference. So in conclusion, they said that meta-analysis for RCT demonstrated that remote monitoring and in-office follow-up showed comparable overall out outcomes related to patient safety and survival with the potential survival benefit in RCTs using daily transmission verification. So initiation of an additional meta-analysis analysis related to RM technology featuring daily transmission verification was proposed. And uh, based on that, the Hendrix and et al. actually they did this analysis of their previous three trials, which they labeled as true coin. They included trust, e-cost, and in-time patients uh, to say whether daily remote monitoring of implantable cardioverter defibrillator insights from the pool patient level data from three randomized control trials help in answering this question of outcomes. And they looked at uh, all-cause death, cardiovascular death, hospitalization, CV hospitalization, and worsening heart failure. And, uh, they showed significant reduction of all cause mortality, about 1.9% absolute reduction of all cause mortality at one year in these three trials, pool data of these three trials. So if we really look at it, the difference is if you look at daily automatic, automatic remote monitoring, 
And if we compare it with remote monitoring system where there's no daily uh, remote transmissions, there is a difference actually. If you can see the all cause mortality is actually lower in patients who have daily automatic remote mo monitoring versus patients who have weekly or two weekly or three weekly remote monitoring. So the three key elements this trial said is you should have a reliable transmission with daily verification. Uh, the daily transmission means you should have at least 85% of time the patient is on remote monitoring. And then another thing which is, was important was disease and patient relevant set for rhythmological and technical parameters should be set as per these trials. Uh, and the workflow should, because just getting information is not important. What do you do with that information is important. So you have should have very good clinical monitoring teams or clinical monitoring units that will actually uh, work or respond to these alerts or parameters. So it's not just the home monitoring, it's the entire system of managing the alert that is important. And 84% of alerts were forward, forwarded by the central monitoring unit to the investigational site. And in response to that telemonitoring data, investigator made contact with 71% of the patient. And the median reaction time in these three trials for telemonitoring alert was one day to contact patient and two days to follow up. And observation did not result in patient contact when it was a repetitive or related to a known condition or when a clinical visit had already been scheduled for the near future. So after that, there was more RCDs on outcome. There was more care, Optilink and RAM heart failure. These were trial published in 2016 and 2017. And if you look at it, they did not show outcome difference in all these three trials. Uh, RAM heart failure was the latest and they used three device manufacturer remote monitoring system. OptiLink and more care was uh, for single manufacturers. But their remote monitoring system was not daily verification. So what about real world data? Uh, this is a very large uh, study from Merl. Uh, actually, this is from Merlin. If we look at it, it was published in 2010. It's not only the remote monitoring, the time if spent in remote monitoring is important. If you can see that the more you are under remote monitoring, the higher the benefit is. And uh, the survival benefit for remote monitoring not only is for CRTD or CRTP or ICD, even pacemaker uh, showed survival benefit. And this is like a study on more than 300,000 patients. And it's the observational data, it's the registry data from uh, Merlin. And if we look at data from attitude, which is a data from latitude, which uh, they also showed the same thing that there is an outcome difference, survival difference between remote monitoring patient with CRT ICDs versus patient who are not on remote monitoring. So uh, in conclusion, Remote monitoring is standard of care for patients with ICDs and CRTDs. Re remote monitoring is safe, efficacious, prevents appropriate and inappropriate shocks, and may save life in patients with ICD and CRTDs. Further advances are warranted to translate the potential advances of remote monitoring into improved patient outcome. Important components to achieve this includes a higher level of connectivity, enabling high intensity remote monitoring, which could be daily transmission, and a well-designed clinical response system facilitating an effective management of actionable events. So it's just, it's not that just getting the data is important. What you do with it, that data is important. With that, I would thank you and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year in advance. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Devinder for such important insights. Uh, can you stop uh, sharing your presentation and we can come in the gallery view. So um, we have uh, 10 to 15 minutes for discussion and uh, maybe I can begin by asking you, so how, what is the response system? You said it's very important to have a prompt response system. So like in India, what happens is that uh, the patient transmits and it is uh, subsequently analyzed by the manufacturers website or their team and then it is given to us uh, over email uh, so, and uh, then of course we can respond at that point of time we can uh, send uh, talk to the patient or uh, call the patient to the hospital 
So are patients allowed to contact directly you or the hospital with the, with the transmission? Okay, uh, so the setup in our NUH is we have actually a set of technicians we have employed for, for monitoring. And these technicians are actually all uh, IBHRE certif certified. And uh, they, get, they get transmission from all the manufacturers. So we usually, you mainly use three manufacturers. And although we don't have a pooled uh, data, at, so we go to individual manufacturers' website and every evening our technicians actually go through the home monitoring alert. So after going through those alert, actually they forward those which are important to us, as well as uh, this can be forwarded to the heart failure team, which could be uh, looking after the patient with us. But if we really talk about in-time data, their clinical, response team was actually is, is, was very good. I don't think we can still match that kind of response. But it's very important to have a set of technicians who are not in, like, you know, because it, it's still, I think industry do help with us, but we have to have our own technicians looking after these patients and contacting, the, contacting with the patient. So in fact, if you don't get a transmission from a device, you will get a risk alert that this patient's device is actually off or switched off. So there should be somebody who should call the patient and tell him that his device, remote monitoring device is off. Yeah, so once uh, you have critical volume, you can have uh, dedicated technicians for this purpose. But till then your team has to look after all the transmission. So that's what happens in most of the hospitals that the care provider's team looks after the transmission, the junior doctors and the team uh, themselves. And many of us have physician assistants who are trained to look at these uh, reports and they can then respond. respond to it. But it's, it happens on a daily basis. But I was saying that uh, does it work in the emergency situations as well? Uh, probably that is the most challenging aspect of remote care. It does because we receive uh, transmission whenever we have a response team. If a patient gets an appropriate shock or an inappropriate shock, we have a response team to call the patient. And okay then reset the parameters. So it's actually pretty fast. We can do it within one day. So imagine if we use, have a patient on a conventional follow-up, sometimes they may not even know they had a shock during sleep. And by the time they come to see us in six months or a year, you know, they may have received few shocks. And I think that is how the ECOS trial showed that you can reduce the number of shock uh, by remote monitoring. It's just that the moment you get a shock, you can act on it. If it is an inappropriate shock, you can reduce further shocks. Right. Thank you. I would request my other co-faculty to participate in the discussion. Dr. Karthike, any comments? Yeah, so um, as uh, we'll know, the remote monitoring is actually not very well accepted in India. It's actually been done at mainly a few places, but the uh, emergence of this pandemic actually uh, somehow uh, and uh, made uh, increase the enthusiasm among, among the physicians as well as the patients to accept it more and more. And so this may be actually a good opportunity to and a good time to uh, start this uh, uh, remote monitoring practice among most of our patients, especially those who uh, are not in the city where the care is being provided. Many patients who had earlier refused uh, uh, the, see, we have a separate system. We have unbundled this therapy from the device cost. Maybe in many countries it is bundled with the initial implant yeah, and uh, yeah. there it becomes like standard of care. But in India, because of economic reasons, it has been un unbundled and, and many, many patients, most of the patients, they, they don't want to invest additional money in remote care. But during the pandemic, many of them switched to remote care because uh, they really wanted and, and the manufacturers also, they came up with this uh, program of providing uh, equipment at their home and, and setting it up during the pandemic. So it became a facilitator. And But definitely the, the outlook has completely changed now and many more patients are now ready to embrace this therapy. Uh, coming to Dr. Uh, Lawrence Jesura's talk, uh, Dr. Lawrence, I think one of the most challenging aspects is managing inappropriate shocks in patients who have a slow VT uh, between, say, 110 to 140. 
and uh, that really uh, tests our skills of programming. Uh, how do you manage uh, these patients? What are the important insights you would like to give the youngsters about how to manage this, these patients with slow VT who uh, are more prone to get inappropriate shocks uh, if we try to program therapies for VT in these patients? <clears throat> Managing a slow VT is a, a nearly a, a nightmare for both the implanter and the ultrophysiologist. I think most of the slow VTs uh, um, traditionally respond well to ATPs. So trying to do a, a ATP termination uh, uh, may be the best way to go about it. Uh, fortunately, the patients who are prone to slow VTs tend to have a slower sinus rates uh, because we have already given them a good amount of antiarrhythmics and uh, beta blockers. They, these people tend to be in a lower rate. So reducing the rate and allowing the device to work on these slow VTs may not be uh, very challenging because somebody who has a, a heart rate of 80, 90, uh, having a slow VT of 100, it may be impossible for you to program the device for that. But fortunately, it, it never happens. Basically, most of these patients' heart rate will be very low. So anything which comes at a range of 80, 100, usually will be a VT. So we can still program. Uh, but uh, uh, most of these patients will ultimately require a radio frequency ablation because these slow VTs are very uh, difficult to manage with the device also. There's a high possibility that ATP may, may not be uh, uh, very much effective. We have seen good number of slow VTs, although... Uh, Scientifically, it's said that they respond very well to ATPs, but they don't respond to anything. Some of the time, you may have to give a program stimulation through your uh, device to terminate these uh, VTs by your programmer. So that's not possible as an ATP. ATP comes only as a burst and ramp and ramp plus. So most of the time, uh, the VTs may not respond to three these three interventions. So ultimately, these patients will require radio frequency ablation. But the most important thing is to know that there is an entity exists that slow VT, because a lot of uh, ICDs are implanted nowadays by our interventional colleagues. So if the patient stays in VT for a longer period after time, the patient presents with a heart failure and a worsening heart function. So uh, immediately you have to identify that VT is going on, you have to convert the VT into a uh, sinus rhythm as early as possible. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, sir, we do have a question in the audience. Yeah? Around yep. three questions are there already. Uh, one for Dr. Jesraj and two for Dr. Devendra. Are you able to see it or should I read it, sir? Uh, no, yes, I think we can see. Yeah, there is a question. What is the average time lag between sensed event and response at the patient level? Yeah, so uh, if a patient has a sensed event, let's say in the daytime, uh, usually the device communicates with the transmitter at night. Most of the manufacturers... Uh, so, excuse me, sir. Uh, Dr. Devendra, kindly... Uh, yeah. Volume can, was very low. Yeah. Can can hear me now? Yeah, better, yes. sir. Okay. So, usually if an event occurs in the daytime, uh, the transmitter actually communicates with the device mostly at midnight. So, maybe about 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. And at that time, the event is actually uh, from the transmitter is sent to the central repository of the device manufacturer. Next day morning, it will come as a alert to the physician. So the time lag can vary about few hours to one day or 24 hours. And uh, the other two questions actually are... They're also <clears throat> probably addressed to you only. One is uh, any difference between single and dual chamber ICD with regard to benefits from remote monitoring? I don't... I, I don't think so because uh, there will be a difference if you have a CRT versus a ICD because with CRT you will get extra information about uh, percentage of biventricular pacing which can sometimes lead to heart failure if you have AF leading to in a decreased by pacing percentage. That is important. Although there may be some difference between discrimination between uh, in a discrimination for IC, uh, VT or it's a relation with RVR, with single and dual chamber pacemaker. But for remote monitoring, I don't think that makes any difference. And then there is a question on, uh, can appropriate shocks reduce ejection fraction in the long run? Ablation should be preferred uh, to yeah. Dr. Lawrence. Yeah, I think uh, during presentation also I stressed upon, all those shocks may be appropriate. Definitely every shock has a, a, a tendency to reduce your ejection fraction on a long run and uh, you will precipitate a heart failure. So my uh, usual dictum is 
uh, that's what's recommended also anything more than three uh, shocks in a year i usually take them for a radio frequency ablation it depends on patient to patient because uh, the acceptance of a, a radio frequency ablation for a vt from the patient side may not be great when they have uh, already undergone a, a costly procedure i if patient is interested um, i i uh, any shock i take for a radio frequency ablation any shock uh, but any patient who has more than three shocks i always advise them for a radio frequency ablation and i don't like to keep on a long term amidron any patient who requires a good dose long term a long a long term amidron maybe more than uh, 200 mg a day requirement i don't consider as a, 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 a like uh, to be on long term amidron so i usually take them for a radio frequency ablation so, but recommended is more than three shocks in a year you usually take them for a right. so actually the question talks about uh, ablation in connection with inappropriate shock which is is self inappropriate so inappropriate shock means uh, the shock was uh, not because of arrhythmia but there are a lot of unnecessary shocks which may be because of uh, non sustained ventricular arrhythmias and all which can be sometimes it can be resolved by appropriate programming and of course if the patient is having frequent shocks as dr lawrence mentioned we should consider ablation in fact uh, in in many countries like us people are very aggressive in recommending very early ablation so even with the first shock or even without shock uh, in patients who have already had a monomorphic vt many people uh, perform ablation and then implant a defibrillator so i think uh, we have run out of time for this session so we can move on to the next session and uh, the next session the next session is on uh, crt therapy and we have uh, two eminent speakers to give us very important insights into various aspects of uh, crt the first talk is uh, by dr sarvanan krishnan from malaysia uh, he is head of department of cardiology and electrophysiology at hospital sultanat bahia malaysia and he is one of the pioneers of cardiac electrophysiology services of ministry of health malaysia of public hospital he will tell us about advanced techniques for complex crt implantation dr sarvanan please thank you very much for that kind introduction the this is oxena uh, can you guys hear me yes we can see your slides yes thank you what is good sir okay so i thank the abbot as well as the aphrs for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity to share uh, some knowledge on uh, uh, crt techniques for uh, techniques of implantation and um, uh, to the ep crowd as well as uh, those uh, budding electrophysiology community out there so these are my disclosures so pacing from the latest activation site typically that is present on the lateral or the postural lateral uh, left ventricular wall is associated with uh, increase or a better response rate to see a patient who receive crt therapy so you can see in this diagram that illustrates very well where is the site of origin in the uh, where is the target site in the lao view uh, ideally in this lateral or the postural lateral targets so thus the the, the usual target of uh, crt implant is for a lv lead placement is uh, usually through the uh, transvenous approach and uh, right atrial and cannulate the coronary sinus ostia to deliver the lead and place it over the suitable uh, target vein that is present over the lateral or the postural lateral area of the left ventricle and uh, this can be very much associated with uh, uh, challenges Uh, which is present or posted uh, post by anatomical barriers uh, in the right atrium uh, which is usually enlarged in the heart failure patients um a presence of uh, you such in reach as well as a uh, tabesin valve along the area of cannulation into the coronary uh, vein 
may pose a significant challenge as illustrated in this picture. And uh, more, more, more so if there is complex uh, takeoff of the target branch that is present in the posterolateral or lateral branch. So implanting CRT can be like a battle in Star Wars against uh, Dark Vader. So for those who like this kind of challenges, implanting CRT, especially placement of the LV lead in the lateral or the targeted uh, lateral or a postural lateral vein will be a uh, fun. So we are very much um, at uh, uh, better hand today because of the availability of uh, uh, suitable tools and uh, introduction of modern techniques in making our CRT implant a success. So one can, uh, if one have a better understanding of the anatomy of the right atrium as well as the CS uh, coronary sinus or coronary vein anatomy, he will be better prepared or he can prepare himself better with the extensive selection of tools that may be picked up or given by the industry and also not to totally depend on the tools given by the industry but also have this cut, typically called as a Wallis cut where you can select any of the approaches from here to uh, facilitate the delivery of the LV lead to the target. So I would like to share two of the cases where we uh, embarked on the uh, difficult uh, anatomy and subsequently able to deliver the uh, LV lead to the target site. So this first patient with a typical indication for CRT for left under branch block, we used uh, Wallis sheet with braided core to locate the coronary uh, ostia uh, uh, by just using the uh, Wallis uh, outer guide sheet as well as the braided core. We were able to uh, advance uh, the uh, sheet into the coronary uh, through the coronary sinus and into the coronary vein. Uh, you can see here that uh, there's a technique that we can uh, use here by advancing the whole uh, apparatus into the right, uh, across the tricuspid valve and subsequently for counterclockwise uh, pullback, this uh, dual system uh, will sit nicely in the ostium of the coronary sinus and help us to engage the coronary sinus uh, uh, easily. So subsequently, we advance the braided core into the coronary vein and uh, 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 into the CS. And we can see with the help of the uh, braided core, we can advance the wallish uh, outer sheath easily into the vein. So during this process, one have to be very careful because there might be some anatomical barrier that could be present uh, along the uh, body of that uh, coronary vein, uh, certain valves or uh, obstacles like uh, can be present that can impede one's effort uh, to cannulate or to advance the sheet. And if you're unlucky, what can happen is as shown in this picture, while you were advancing the balloon catheter to perform a occlusion venography, you can see there's some staining here. So what exactly happened was there is a destruction of the intima at the possible vein at that site, which has caused uh, extravasation of the contrast into the fat around the coronary uh, 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 into the CS body. So what we did was we did not panic, but we pulled back the balloon catheter and did a proximal occlusion venography, which actually showed the presence of a possible target vein here. So this is in the LA view. And what we did was 
subsequently we with the help of extra support wire gently advance extra support wire through and advance the advancement of the sheet uh, into across the cs into the greater cardiac vein and we are able to explore using the extra support wire for the branch uh, branches that can be uh, targeted for a delivery of the lv lead so in this ra view we repeated the venogram and it shows a branch of a branch that has got a very proximal uh, very tortuous proximal takeoff it is not clearly seen well here but can really see the collateral branches that connects this lateral tributary of this vein into the middle cardiac vein so at this point of time um, it's it's a uh, a nightmare to see this uh, staining of the contrast here but then with uh, additional tools or uh, uh, the correct appropriate apparatus that is present in the lab may help you to uh, plan a strategy to cannulate this way for uh, uh, subsequent procedure so one look here this is a still image of the same picture there's an angulated takeoff the vein is long long enough to accommodate possibly a quadrupolar lead if we can deliver uh, to reach the uh, middle or a distal portion of this uh, left ventricular wall so we decided to use the vein selector from merit medical uh, a standard chip vein uh, selector and as you can see here this vein selector as we vein selector as we pull back it actually engage, en engages the uh, provided access to this branch and uh, you try to probe this branch with a wire with extra support wire and manage to actually advance it further to the end and there we could see that it actually comes back to another branch up there so we suspect that possibly there might be uh, other branches draining um, collaterally connected collat uh, with collateral connection with this vein so we took a selective venogram in this branch we find that the presence of a proximal branch that could be targeted for uh, delivery of the lead so with the wire left in place we advance another wire into the more proximal branch and as you can see that the proximal branch why actually could be passed all the way down and thus we move the vein selector into the proximal branch and took a selective venogram here which actually delineated the whole length of that branch and the collateral draining into the middle cardiac vein so this in place we thought we can deliver a quadrupolar lead through this however as you can see that we find difficulty to advance this so we could have uh, selected the vein sub selector earlier and deliver this but as we were trying to advance the wire further we, we just assess whether this can be looped all the way back into the cs as that could be uh, that can provide a better support for us to deliver the lead so as the wire was advanced and uh, into the cs bo uh, body again so we thought uh, we can use a snare technique um, to take the advantage between the collateral vessel that is present between the cs branches uh, to pass at, to deliver the lead through the difficult anatomy so here 
once we pass the wire back into the CS body through the medial cardiac vein, we deploy the snare at the ostium of the medial cardiac vein to snare the proximal wire at about 15 uh, uh, centimeter from the tip. And if managed to fix this wire at this location, and subsequently we're able to advance the lead, the quadrupolar lead into the small branch at the lateral part of the left ventricle. So this case illustrates the use of a snare. We used a one snare, which is with a 10 mm loop to snare the wire and fix it and subsequently rail the lead over the wire, fixed wire into the target location. And this is the final result. So learning point from these cases, presence of angulated and tortuous target vein, especially in the proximal portion, uh, and can pose a significant challenge to the implanter. Standard vein selector can be useful to access the target vein. Selective venogram identified the collaterals into the middle cardiac vein, which can be potentially used um, to snare the wire back and uh, deliver the uh, lead into the wanted location. So we used the orthodromic snare technique as a choice to deliver and fix a lead to distal branch for better stability. The second patient, we have a, this is a silly image of the a possible target branch that is present in the lateral uh, left ventricular wall. But one loop, this is not going to be easy because uh, gaining access into this branch uh, with acute band, with a proximal toxicity, or a possible stenosis or a valve present, they may obstruct the passage of a, a wire and subsequent uh, tools for a successful LV lead delivery. So we attempted this with the uh, Senju catheters, CPS uh, outer guide uh, catheter, and uh, tried, attempted to wire down with extra support wire through uh, this branch. Uh, you can see that there is presence of two wires here for body wire technique. So interventional skill that we often learn uh, during our PCI will be very helpful and uh, uh, in this in this uh, circumstance. However, this posed a significant challenge to us. So what we decided was uh, every time we try to uh, bring down the, uh, pass the wire down, we find it very difficult to actually uh, keep the sheet, the outer sheet, as well as the uh, subselection catheter in place uh, as a, it was kicking back. So we decided to make a loop with this wire and bring down a, a, a small balloon. In fact, we tried earlier with uh, nitrates and so on, uh, but it did not give us, uh, it did not allow us to um, gain access into this branch uh, smoothly. So what we did was uh, we ballooned this segment with a 2O tan balloon at nominal pressure and uh, so th this slide, uh, the other this shows the difficulty of wiring cannulating the gaining access to this branch is how we got it earlier and subsequently we ballooned it but to a balloon and uh, post balloon venoplasty so there's some uh, dissection here. However, at this point of time, we decided that uh, we'll put in a stent. So a bare metal stent of 2.5 by 14 mm uh, deployed at nominal pressure here. And subsequently, this helped us to further advance the wire down uh, smoothly to a location further down. And um, 
you take the advantage of the uh, distal placement of the wire and support uh, gain from this uh, wire placement to advance a uh, quadrupolar lead into um, into the target location. So we know uh, we we know that from uh, a stenotic CS branch can be approached with a venoplasty and stenting that could uh, help us to deliver the uh, LV lead into an ideal target vein in about seven percent of patients from total set wall is uh, reports 2003. So this helped us to deliver the uh, so post stenting the angulated segment was straightened. And we are able to advance the quadrupolar lead into the lateral branch vein. And we obtained a uh, very good threshold at this segment, although there are reported cases where um, uh, in, the, in the lateral segment, usually we expect a high phrenic nerve capture and a possible uh, need to relocate uh, the LV lead to another site. So, I, uh, in these uh, two cases that I have presented, uh, what uh, I would like to share that the knowledge of uh, PCI techniques may help us to, in the placement of, uh, of uh, LB lead at the uh, optimal site for better responsiveness to CRT therapy. So variation in the anatomy and cause of the target coronary vein may impose significant challenges. Advances techniques like snaring, minoplasty, stenting, and appropriate selection of tools may uh, make the procedure a success. So with that, I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sarvanan. Excellent, excellent cases and wonderful presentation. Uh, do we have any? Questions from the audience. Oh, I think we will have discussion at the end of Dr. Bhargav's lecture. So I now invite Dr. Bhargav to deliver his talk. Dr. Bhargav is a uh, personal friend and a very, very renowned electrophysiologist in India. He's director of cardiac electrophysiology and pacing at Medanta Medicity India. He is, uh, he has tremendous expertise uh, and more than 15 years in the field of cardiac electrophysiology and pacing. Dr. Bhargav also performs lead extractions and also performs 2D and 3D electrophysiology studies and catheterization of complex arrhythmias. Uh, Dr. Bhargav, please. Thank you, Dr. Saxena, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank uh, APHRS and Abbott for providing me the opportunity to speak on this important topic. And that is CRT optimization to improve hemodynamic response. Now, we all know that uh, CRT is a highly beneficial therapy and uh, for heart failure patients with left ventricular systolic function and electrical conduction delay, primarily left bundle branch block. And this was very elegantly shown in randomized controlled trials, which were initially done in patients with NYHA class three or four heart failure with left bundle branch block. And later on, uh, it uh, where the earlier trial showed only improvement in morbidity, reduction in heart failure hospitalization, and improvement in quality of life. But the later trials like KRHF also showed that CRT improves mortality in these patients. And the recent trials have also shown that this uh, uh, therapy is also effective in patients with mild heart failure, NYHA1, NYHA2, like the uh, reverse, the RAFT, and the uh, married CRT trials. And, uh, but despite this being an effective therapy, about one third of the patients do not experience the full benefit of CRT. Again, the non-response rate has varied in different trials, but on an average is about 30 to 40% in different trials. Now, the reason is that the response to CRT is inadequate and unpredictable. Though we have certain predictors which will indicate a good response to CRT, like typical left bundle branch morphology, uh, wide QRS duration, the uh, female gender, and non-ischemic etiology compared to the ischemic etiology. But when we implant a device in a patient, uh, we are still uncertain whether the patient is likely to res respond or not. And only 
only the time only tells uh, at six months echo whether the patient will be a responder or not. And if we look at the typical uh, response rates, about 35% of the patients will respond, uh, respond with reduction in LV syst and systolic volume from 15 to 30%. And about 20% patients will be super responder where the reduction in end systolic volume is more than 30%. But unfortunately, about 30 to 40% patients either are negative responders or non-responders with reduction in end systolic volume less than uh, 15%. Now, there have been multiple reasons for suboptimal CRT response. This is a slide which is often shown in uh, similar kind of talks and which was a study done and published by Mullins et al. way back in 2009, which looked at multiple causes of which suboptimal AV timing was the most important. The other being arrhythmias, anemia, suboptimal LV lead position, less percentage of bi v facing, et cetera. And so as you can see, there are multiple different kind of issues. And so achieving maximum CRT response requires a multidisciplinary approach looking at uh, the implant selection of the patient, selection of typical um, uh, tools and hardware, uh, the LV lead position, the post implant programming and correction of other issues like anemia, arrhythmia, which have to be done by uh, uh, the physicians of different specialties. So uh, how, what are the different methods as an electrophysiologist and as an implanter and as a physician who will look at the post-implant follow-up of these patients, what are the methods that one can choose to optimize the CRT response? Now, there are three things that we can look into. One is the optimal lead position and the type of lead, the optimal uh, AV and VV delays, and finally, uh, using algorithms like multipoint pacing to improve uh, uh, and increase the uh, resynchronization in different segments of the left ventricle. Now, the LV lead position, as was shown by Dr. Sarvan, and also is a very important uh, 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 parameter in uh, uh, predicting the response. And the typical locations where we find good response is in the posterior, posterolateral, and the lateral regions, in the basal and mid uh, segments of the uh, left ventricle, as was elegantly shown by this study from the analysis of MADRID CRT data by Jagmeet Singh et al. Uh, and published way back in 2011. And it was shown that the apical position is not a good uh, uh, location for facing the left ventricle, but because of instability in basal locations, uh, bipolar lead at times, uh, we may have to position in the apical leads. The other uh, thing, again, uh, Dr. Sarvan and showed that uh, the LV uh, vector if you pace at a site which is which shows delayed activation during sinus rhythm, the likelihood of response is much better. And it was again shown way back in 2006 by a study from again Jagmeet Singh that uh, the LV ventricular lead electrical delay predicts response to cardiac synchronization therapy. Again, uh, multiple studies uh, you know, published in 2011 and even later in 2015 showed that left ventricular electrical delay is a predictor of uh, response and also predicts survival in patients with CRT. And the parameter that we look at is QLV, which is from the onset of the QRS to the uh, time where the left ventricular lead or the pacing vector senses the electrical uh, uh, the signal during sinusism. And this QLV was shown in this study to be uh, an important predictor in identifying good LV pacing sites and strongly associated with the response. And in this study, the QLV of more than 95 milliseconds showed a good response. And if the QLV was less than 95 milliseconds, the response rate was not good. You can see in this right bottom panel that in the first half, the, the, the uh, QLV is less than 95, 90 milliseconds. And so we know that the patient is not likely to benefit Whereas in the second panel at another location in the same patients, the QLV is 165, indicating a good outcome with CRT in this likelihood of patient. The another use, another point is that the availability of quadripolar leads provides definite advantages that uh, one of them is stability. Suppose your 
uh, lead is of short length, we typically tend to place a bipolar lead in the apical region, uh, region, uh, region for better stability. However, that results in poor uh, hemodynamic and clinical outcome. But with the availability of uh, quadripolar lead, we can place the lead apically and uh, but pace the left ventricle from a basal electrode resulting in better stability avoidance of phrenic nerve capture and a good clinical outcome uh, overall so quadripolar lead availability has made a lot of difference and though these devices are a little more expensive but have become the standard and have also been shown to improve mortality among patients compared to uh, bipolar lead in patients undergoing crt Another advantage of using quadripolar lead is that you have multiple pacing vectors available and uh, about 10 to 16 pacing vectors may be available whether you are using, depending on whether you are doing a CRT D device or a CRT P device. And so there is always at least one vector uh, which is available, which shows a late, elect a good electrical delay, also has lack of phrenic nerve capture and has a good pacing threshold in order to have effective CRT delivery uh, with this quadripolar lead. So quadripolar lead selection has made a lot of difference in the clinical outcome of the patients. So this is how you measure the traditional QLV uh, interval, which is from the onset of the QRS to the where the sharpest uh, uh, up downstroke of the LV signal is in the left ventricular uh, lead. And typically this is uh, measured during the implant but can also be measured uh, later on during interrogation. Another surrogate for QLV is the RV-LV conduction time. That is the time measured from the right ventricular sense time uh, to the left ventricular sense time during sinus rhythm. And this, this can be done during uh, interrogation from the CRT toolkit of the device uh, while programming. And it can be used to select which electrode out of the four electrodes in a quadripolar lead uh, is a best suited one for a better clinical outcome because the one showing more RVLV conduction time is likely to give a better uh, clinical and hemodynamic response in the long term. So you, this is how you check the RVLV conduction time. You can check it during both uh, uh, sinus rhythm where the intrinsic conduction is intact or during RV pacing. And then you see that if you select the electrode where the RVLV conduction time is the maximum. And then if the threshold is acceptable at this location, you will uh, you can choose the, uh, the latest activating electrode to get a good uh, clinical outcome in the long term. Then coming to the AV delay programming, uh, traditionally we have been doing AV and VV delay optimization using echocardiographic methods, but uh, those are very cumbersome, time consuming, tedious, and require an expert echocardiographer uh, during programming and follow-up of these patients, which, which is totally impractical in today's uh, busy times of the electrophysiologist. Uh, but most of these devices, the CRT devices now come with some um, uh, in, in, in device in, uh, uh, algorithms which optimize the AV and VV delays automatically and these Abbott devices have an algorithm which is known as QuickOpt, which uses the duration of light right atrial contraction to set the AV delay such that the ventricular contraction occurs fully after the atrial depolarization and uh, contraction uh, and uh, sets the paced AV delay as sensed AV delay plus 50 milliseconds. So this is how it looks for the AV delay, the interatrial conduction delay is estimated by the sensed right atrial to left atrial activation time or the duration of atrial intracardiac electrogram. And QCOP utilizes this concept to calculate the optimal AV and PV delay using sophisticated calculations. And the goal of optimizing the AV and PV delays is to allow for completion of atrial kick prior to the onset of ventricular contraction. Similarly, it uh, uh, also calculates, estimates the VV delays and uh, the paced and sense tests are performed uh, from the RV and the left ventricle to characterize the conduction properties of the ventricle and the RV to LV interval is also measured during sinusism. 
and the delays between the right and the left ventricular depolarization are measured and offset is calculated and the ultimate goal of providing the optimal vv delay is to time the right and left ventricular stimulation so that the resulting left ventricular depolarization is completed as quickly as possible resulting in a, a narrow qrs uh, uh, after the programming now the the qcopt is fairly good in estimating optimal av and vv delays but the limitation is that you can do it during the time you are doing the programming but we don't know what is going to happen at different times of the day at different activity levels of the patient and hence dynamic optimization uh, is also important and we know that the optimal av and vv delays may change over time as well and the typical recommendation is that you need to optimize these av and vv delays over uh, every 3 months or so so av and vv optimization uh, during crt we do it uh, immediately after implant or next day after implant and then every 3 to 6 monthly based on the patient's clinical response traditionally we have been using echo based method but ecg based methods can be used and which are easier but now the device based methods are the most convenient but have the limitation that they are not dynamic the qcop one is not dynamic and does not take into account the effect of exercise or other other physical states of the patient and uh, there may be shortening of pr at other times and may result in reduction in percentage by we pacing if we strictly go by the qcop uh, estimates and it is not useful during complete av block or during atrial fibrillation and uh, where we may have to resort to another method so there is a new algorithm which is now available which is the sync av crt it is uh, basically a new dynamic timing feature for uh, available presently for quadripolar uh, leads and devices it individualizes and dynamically adjusts the timing or the av delay based on the patient's intrinsic rhythm and intrinsic av conduction and drives the fusion with intrinsic rhythm so basically it looks at the uh, intrinsic conduction across the av node hyperkinesis system and changes the uh, av delay programmed av delay based on the intrinsic av conduction and can also be combined with multi point pacing to get the most optimal uh, qrs uh, duration during this time so uh, during traditional by we pacing we tend to keep the av interval short and pre excites the pre excite the left and the right ventricles but uh, the native conduction gets lost and so uh, to prevent uh, loss of by we pacing during shorter pr intervals during ac physical activity but the sync av crt the rv and lv pacing occur simultaneously with intrinsic conduction resulting in a combination of rv lv and right bundle branch block uh, uh, right bundle branch uh, fusion and this results in dynamically optimizing the av delays uh during different levels of physical activity in the lv alone mode the sync av crt there is only left ventricular pacing which occurs simultaneously with the intrinsic conduction resulting in fusion with the uh, intrinsic av conduction and the right ventricle in this uh, mode is activated exclusively by the right bundle branch and rv pacing during crt is uh, minimized now it has has been shown by uh, studies by dr neeraj verma uh, published in 2018 wherein they looked at uh, four different modes uh, biventricular only with nominal settings sync av default with minus 50 seconds 50 milliseconds delta uh, of sync av sync av optimal looking at uh, the narrowest qrs uh, and optimized av delays and programmed uh, optimized uh, sync av delta and the fourth mode was lv only programming with the sync av delta of minus 50 milliseconds and found that the sync av optimized showed the narrowest qrs and most uh, reduction in the qrs interval compared to the baseline and if we combine with multi point pacing another study showed and presented in 2016 in aphrs showed that uh, mpp and sync av crt delivery results in optimal qrs duration with which is maximum compared to the uh, best by we paced uh, optimized qr uh, av and vv delays multi point programming alone sync ov alone and so sync av plus mpp gives the best qrs 
it has also been shown in another study which was presented last year in hrs that the risk of developing atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation of more than 24 hours is lower in patients who have syncav on compared to those where syncav is programmed off so this may also help in reducing the atrial arrhythmias the newer uh, abbott devices which are uh, which have in inherent uh, remote monitoring capability like the galant uh, hf have uh, enhanced algorithms which is known as the syncav plus crt technology where apart from the crt delta options you have percentage delta option which is available resulting in a relative rather than absolute shortening of the uh, av intervals there is also option of permanently programming av delays in patients who have intermittent complete av block which allows for paced and sensed av delays to be programmed independent of sync av programming and then there are patient specific ratios used for av delay calculations and alleviates over and under shortening to, to promote fusion pacing so this is the new ability to program the pace and sensed av delays which will work independently of the sync av algorithm in in times where there is complete av block also the percentage uh, pacing the uh, uh, the the sync av plus crt delta we can program as a percentage rather than as fixed 50 millisecond or 60 millisecond interval wherein this percentage will be uh, give a relative rather than absolute shortening and it is quite useful in patients who have high resting vagal tone where the pr interval may be long during resting periods but shortens markedly during activity and programming a fixed sync av delta may result in optimal av delays at rest but uh, may result in predominant by v pacing without uh, intrinsic conduction if the same fixed delta is used at during exercise also whereas this percentage uh, sync av plus crt delta will result in a relative uh, shortening resulting in fusion of the intrinsic conduction at all times so this is how it works where in this example the sensed av delay is about uh, 233 millisecond the intrinsic av conduction and when we program the fixed delta of minus 50 milliseconds this sensed av delay becomes 153 milliseconds whereas if we programmed a percentage of 20 minus 20 percent it is about 162 percent and this percentage remains same whether patient exercises and in his intrinsic av conduction time decreases uh, more than uh, usual now it was shown in a study done last year and presented in heart rhythm and published in heart rhythm in last year where optimal sync kv offsets of absolute and relative were compared and updated sync kv plus crt technology allows the uh, offset as percentage of av normal and found that the uh, the the percentage of patients showing response was much better and predictable and resulted in more predictable and consistent QRS narrowing compared to patient who had a fixed offset. The last uh, point uh, that I will be talking about is multi-point pacing. This basically works on the, on the concept that if you pace the left ventricle from one side, you may still have non-uniform resynchronization. But if you have multiple pacing vectors available in the left ventricle, and then it may result in uh, uh, better uh, patterns of depolarization, engagement of areas around the scar, better hemodynamic, and more uniform resynchronization. Multipoint pacing may allow pacing from two LV sides from the uh, through the one quadripolar lead, resulting in uh, uh, not using multiple leads for uh, getting multipoint pacing or pacing from multiple sides. So this is how the quadripolar lead you can pace from the two different vectors, either the distal or the proximal or choose those with the widest spacing or showing those with earliest and latest activation, depending on the, uh, the threshold and pacing threshold and the uh, phrenic nerve capture in different vector locations. So the programming options are either LV first, where you can program LV1, LV2, and then RV or RV first, where you program RV first and then LV1 and LV2, 
and you can have two delays between LV1 and LV2 and LV2 and RV uh, also. The earlier study showed that uh, multi-site pacing uh, with a quadrupolar left ventricular lead results in better hemodynamic improvement as was seen in this study done using a guide wire pressure sensor, which showed better DP by DT measurements during multi-point pacing compared to traditional by V pacing. More studies looking at clinical response showed that multi-point pacing showed a better 12-month response data with 19% higher absolute response and 44% relative risk reduction in the non-responders and it was an early study published uh, in uh, 2016. Again, more studies again showing that there is higher chance of uh, being a super responder or a responder and the number of non-responders reduces if you use multi-point pacing. However, the most uh, recent uh, published data which looked at whether multi-point pacing can be used in who are non-responders and convert non-responders to responders, the more CRT MP study, wherein the MPP was uh, programmed at the end of six months, only in patients who did not respond to CRT uh, and was randomized to MPP off, did not show a marked benefit. But again, this study had a lot of uh, design flaws and uh, 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 the uh, switching on MPP at the end of six months of CRT delivery may itself have resulted in uh, negating the usefulness of multi-point pacing technology. So I'll end with uh, saying that CRT is an established therapy for selected patients with heart failure due to reduced ejection fraction. But despite its proven efficacy in reducing morbidity and mortality, about 30 to 40% of patients are non-responders. Few have unsuccessful implant and 15 to 20% have complications and issues related to lead dislodgement PNS or high pacing threshold during follow-up. Advances in lead technology like use of quadripolar lead and devices, use of algorithms like QCOPT, SYNC AV and SYNC AV plus, and use of multi-point pacing may help in optimizing hemodynamic and clinical response to CRT in most patients. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we can have some Question answers. Thank you. Easy. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Karthike. I think that was a very comprehensive and excellent presentation. And you clarified most of the points associated, I mean, related to the programming of these devices. And as we uh, can see from your insights, uh, CRT itself is, of course, very effective, but uh, the effectiveness can be further increased by appropriate use of various algorithms. And of course, the proper positioning of the LV lead is very, very vital in getting the full benefit of uh, CRT. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? We don't have any questions from the yeah, audience, but uh, can I ask you, Dr. Kartike, what is your, in your personal practice, what is your preference? Uh, do you look at the, uh, do you just leave the, the, the setting out of box in the beginning or you do the algorithm based uh, programming or optimization or echo guided optimization? or you look at the QRS and then decide whether you want to do any optimization or not? Yeah, so, so the way I do is that uh, once I have implanted the lead, connected the device, and while I am suturing, I usually have the 12 lead ECG attached during that implant time itself. And so that gives the best opportunity to actually uh, do your CRT programming. And so what I do is I'll do use the CRT toolkit at that time look at what the device suggests, what is the vector which is showing the latest electrical activation. And then I'll, I program the device in such that manner. And if I find that the QRS looks quite good with this, with good amount of QRS uh, duration reduction, I accept that. But if I feel that there is a scope for further improvement, I do certain uh, uh, changes in the programming depending on the uh, uh, what is the QRS uh, vector in the lead where the RV and LV pacing is uh, in the opposite direction. For example, lead one, V1 will show positive QRS while you're pacing the left ventricle, but will show a negative QRS when you're pacing the right ventricle and during intrinsic conduction. So this is the lead which I will focus on. Similarly, lead one 
also gives you a similar kind of opportunity so i use these leads or any other lead which will give a similar kind of opportunity to um, change the av vv delays and see where the qrs is the best and uh, uh, provided the lv forces are uh, adequate so this is how i do it at during implant while i am doing the suturing uh, or my assistant is doing the suturing and then again recheck at the with the 12 lead ecg the immediately post implant and the day next to implant and then uh, this is i don't do the echo guided optimization routinely only once in a while when it is needed uh, in patients when they come as a non responder during follow up then only we do echo guided programming nowadays thank you uh, thank you for your comments dr sarvan do you have any comments to make Uh, you will have to unmute yourself yes i i don't have any comments to make um, just uh, to share i do programming similar to what dr katigayan has mentioned and uh, the, traditionally um, uh, looking at the site where we place the lv lead i think it's very important absolutely and uh, Uh, looking at the qrs uh, together with the site of placement i think that plays an important uh, uh, role to decide uh, whether this patient is going to be a responder or not thank you i think we have run out of time as well and uh, i thank both of you for excellent uh, presentations and good discussion and i think all the speakers have done a commendable job and i must thank uh, abbot for organizing this wonderful program uh with support from APHRS uh thank you uh, jeremy thank you sabri uh it has been excellent working with you thank you so much thank you very much sir we sincerely thank you for helping us and supporting us all through the programs and helping to chair this program coordinate excellently and also the faculties who have taken the time to prepare the presentation to throw light on the difficult situations and how to manage it. thank you everybody sir and thank you all the participants who are taking time to be part of this program and we sincerely thank you all and take leave for today but we'll soon meet again in another education program and this will help us to continuously improve with the experience from this different set of international experts thank, thank you everybody you. thank you thank sir you. thank you thank you everyone stay thank safe you. and take care Okay Jeremy so how are you all well with you Oh yeah so um